Tiger, Jack, Arnie. We're all familiar with the names of the greatest golfers of all time. Or are we? Meet John Montague. Once hailed as one of the world's best players by renowned sports writer Grantland Rice, his ability and exploits are largely unknown. And that's just how the mysterious Montague wanted it. While many venture to the bright lights of Hollywood in hopes of making their name, when Montague arrived in Tinseltown in 1930, he had no aspirations to be on the silver screen. Instead, he preferred to live in the shadows. The barrel-chested, big-hitting right-hander with bespoke clubs could often be found at public golf courses where wagers with unsuspecting playing partners would fuel his lifestyle. His driver, twice the size of the average club during that day and age, would regularly send the ball over 300 yards when very few at the time could reach that distance. His iron plane putting were equally impressive and his showmanship extended to his post-round antics where his physical prowess was also renowned. He soon became a man to know and earned an invite to join the Lakeside Golf Club in Toluca Lake, a playground for many stars of the day who worked at nearby Paramount, First National and Universal movie lots. The likes of Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Oliver Hardy, Johnny Meismuller, Douglas Fairbanks, Howard Hughes, Humphrey Bogart, and W.C. Fields were all members and could regularly be found on the course or in the clubhouse. It was here Montague's legend and his fan base grew. There's the story of him lifting the 300-pound Oliver Hardy off the ground with one hand, the bet where he knocked a bird off a telephone wire 175 yards away, the time he stuffed a big screen star George Bancroft into a locker, and the wager he could fire a ball through the narrowest of gaps in a clubhouse window and onto the club's putting green. There was also the small matter of the lakeside course record in the club championship in 1933. I'm not that way. The most famous story of the time involved a bet he made with Bing Crosby, a frequent playing partner at the lakeside club. I surrendered it and at the time, the most famous voice in America and one of its biggest movie stars. After losing a match to Montague, Crosby bemoaned his luck and insisted that on another day he would have triumphed over his playing part. Montague dismissed that claim and bet he could beat Crosby with a baseball bat, a shovel, and a rake. An accomplished player himself, Crosby jumped at the chance and accepted the wager. The warning signs were there as Montague retrieved his chosen implements from his car. He then proceeded to use the baseball bat to hit his drive 350 yards, where it found a bunker. Undaunted, he then splashed out to eight feet with his shovel. Using the handle of his rake like a pool cue, Montague holed out for a birdie to beat Crosby's par and win the bet. His sensational and unorthodox stroke play was later recreated for the cameras, and the story would also inspire a memorable scene in Tin Cup, the 1996 movie starring Kevin Cosner. An increasingly intriguing aspect of Montague was his quest for anonymity in a place where fame was more often than not the goal. Despite his undoubted ability, he shunned tournament invites and reportedly turned down the prospect of lucrative exhibition matches against the likes of Bobby Jones and Walter Hagen, insisting he only played for fun. Such was his desire for secrecy, he would shun media attention and refuse to pose for photographs. If anyone did capture him, he would destroy the film or offer a bribe to ensure it was never developed. The famed sports writer, fellow Lakeside member and noted golfer Grantland Rice knew a good story and a good player when he saw one. As his playing partner one day at nearby Riviera Country Club, Rice witnessed Montague's class and his aversion to publicity firsthand. Montague reached the 18th needing only a par to shoot 61 and claim the course record but he deliberately fired his ball into the rough before telling his caddy he was calling it a day. Asked to explain his actions, he said, I don't want the notoriety. Rice would later herald Montague's amazing physical power and his ability to play any type of shot the game called for. I have played several rounds with John Montague, Rice wrote in his syndicated newspaper column, and I'll take him as an even bet over any golfer you can name over a championship course. 
Despite this high praise, Montague managed to continue living in relative anonymity until Time magazine dispatched a reporter and photographer to lift the lid off the man and his story. Montague rebuffed their attempts to secure an interview, and the reporter was forced to piece a profile together from other sources. He's about 33, 5 foot 10 inches, 220 pounds, read the eventual dispatch. He is built like a wrestler with tremendous hands, bulldog shoulders, and biceps half again as big as Jack Dempsey's. His face is handsome, disposition genial. He can consume abnormal quantities of whiskey. The photographer did, however, grab some grainy shots of his target, having hidden in the bushes somewhere at the lakeside. And so the world finally caught a glimpse of the man they called the mysterious Montague. His headline-grabbing exploits caught the attention of law enforcement officers in New York, who by now were convinced Montague was actually Laverne Moore, a prime suspect in an armed robbery in upstate New York who had evaded capture since the night of the crime back in 1930. Fingerprints and photographs were exchanged with their Los Angeles counterparts and later confirmed they had their man at last. News of Montague's arrest shocked his Hollywood friends, with Hardy and Crosby among those to offer support and arrange for big-name lawyers to fight his case in Los Angeles and later in New York. On his arrest, Montague admitted that his real name was indeed Laverne Moore. His secret was out. On his return to New York, he visited his parents, who he had not seen for seven years. It was a moment of calm before full details of the shocking crime were revealed at trial and relayed to the world by an increasing band of reporters. Four masked men armed with pistols had robbed the Hannah Roadhouse restaurant, tied up the family, and beaten up the grandfather before making their escape with several hundred dollars. One of the men was killed in a car accident during the escape. Another two were apprehended and later jailed. All three were friends of Moore. The fourth man disappeared into the night, but a number of items found in one of the getaway cars implicated more, including a set of golf clubs, his driver's license, and draft registration card. Moore claimed to be at home asleep on the night in question, and his mother provided an alibi to strengthen his case. However, the court was also told Moore had left town the morning after the robbery, with his subsequent whereabouts and reason for leaving unknown to his family. If Montague was at all concerned about his fate, it wasn't showing. One evening during the trial, cameras caught him enjoying the New York Yankees World Series victory party alongside the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio. The jury eventually found in Montague's favor, but their verdict drew scorn from the judge. I am sorry to say that your verdict is not in accordance with the one I think you should have rendered, said Judge Harry E. Owen. It was a huge relief for Montague, who was held aloft by his supporters and carried out of the courtroom. Now a free man, Montague vowed to dedicate himself to golf. But at 34 years old, out of shape, and having barely played for almost two years, he faced an uphill battle. Fresh from his acquittal, Montague fully embraced his new celebrity status, starting with an exhibition match just a few weeks after the trial. Montague teed it up alongside baseball great Babe Ruth, legendary Olympian and rising golf star Babe Zaharias, and noted amateur Sylvia Annenberg at Fresh Meadow Country Club in Long Island. Interest was high. A reported 10,000 tickets were sold for the event, but little thought was given to crowd control measures. Fans swarmed each hole and lined the fairways, desperate to catch a glimpse of the action. And at one point, the sizable Ruth was knocked to the ground. At one stage, Montague was forced to wait 15 minutes for the crowd to move back far enough for him to play a shot. And later, he saw his ball stolen before he could reach it. By the ninth hole, the celebrity four ball had had enough and retreated to the safety of the clubhouse. The headlines read, Stampeding Golf Crowd Stops Charity Contest in New York. Montague and Annenberg lost the match an interest in the event fueled his belief ahead of his return to Hollywood. Montague continued to cash in on his celebrity in the form of an equipment sponsorship deal and a series of exhibition matches. He was still able to showcase his array of trick shots, but his headline-grabbing game, and more importantly, his low scores, 
had deserted him. Montague never turned pro, but he did qualify for the U.S. Open in 1940. However, a first round 80 and a second of 82 saw him miss the cut by nine shots. His dreams of becoming a golfer were over. Montague's marriage to wealthy widow Esther Plunkett brought happiness and financial security. But her death in 1947 appeared to send him in a spiral with an arrest for drunk driving and a heart attack following soon thereafter. Montague's money-making schemes included a potential movie, and he even sought the advice of Bobby Jones on an instructional book, only to have the Grand Slam winner tell him he would be better off trying to make his money from his colorful life. It was left to noted sports writer Lee Mondale to shine a light on Montague's extraordinary life with his outstanding biography that was published in 2008. Troubled by health issues in later life, John Montague died alone at a residence motel on Ventura Boulevard in Los Angeles in 1972. He was 68 years old. At the time of his death, he was still working at a local driving range, where few probably realized they were learning from a legendary golfer, one once heralded as the best in the world.